Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to this session. I hope there's some things in here, some points and some examples that I can share with you that uh, might give you some ideas and share some things with you. Uh, I, I forgot that I had written that biography and to kind of give you a fast forward to it. Uh, as an undergraduate student, I was in ROTC and then uh, that got me a commission in the Army and the Corps of Engineers. I misread their travel brochures and ended up in Alaska, which turned out to be a good blessing because I fell in love with the place, got an MBA there, uh, went back east or as far as Ohio to Kent State to get a doctorate and uh, went back to Fairbanks, Alaska for, to, in order to be on the faculty there. And uh, in the last six years, I was on the faculty full time. I was the development director for the Arctic Region Supercomputing Center, which had extra benefits because it gave me the opportunity to travel to many different places, Washington, D.C., usually five or six times a year uh, to do that. I retired from there, got tired of the winters in Fairbanks, which are just flat out long and cold, moved to the banana belt of Alaska, which is called Anchorage. You know, people only live in Anchorage because it's only 30 minutes from Alaska. You drive down the road and pretty soon you're out of the city and away from Nordstrom's and the malls and box stores and things and then you're in Alaska. But last year, to kind of clarify things, uh, all of our children grew up and our children and grandchildren moved back to the East Coast. So my wife and I decided to relocate. So I, I actually live in North Carolina, uh, just west of Asheville in the mountains, because that gets me access to things like this and other conferences and things that my wife has interested, uh, interest in and uh, grandchildren as well. Out of all of that work that I've done in faculty, and I taught operations research and production management, and, got a, and even when I moved to Anchorage for 12 years before I moved out of Alaska, I was teaching as an adjunct, teaching uh, computer simulation modeling as a graduate elective in the School of Engineering uh, in Anchorage. And the best thing I can say about that was those were all mid-career people who are full-time employed, and I t learned so much from all of them. And I've also done a number of co consulting projects, and I'm going to show you some examples that I used in classes and some examples of various projects I worked on. Because the thing that I want to emphasize here uh, goes into this picture, and I kind of want you to hold this in memory as I talk, because the issue is right here. I'm interested in especially the last two feet between the screen and the person. And I'm interested because I'll show you some advance how the advances in all of the hardware and technology and storage and transmission of data has just exploded. It is absolutely phenomenal. But this thing up here hasn't had an upgrade in a million years. The old joke is in my next life I'm going to have more memory installed because I just can't keep, keep it all straight. But I, I, the meter or the three feet or the two feet, something like that, how do we present that information so that people understand it? And I'm going to give you, at the end of the presentation, some off-the-wall examples because I find that there are clues to me on, aha, that's how we ought to be doing that stuff. Also, uh, I, I copied off a one-page set of notes, so if any of you are interested afterwards, you're welcome to grab one of these. I just came across an article in Harvard Business Review talking about how important it is to make slide notes. So you can enjoy the slide presentation if there's anything really important. It doesn't have a lot of the visuals on here, but it has uh, s some of the more salient points for doing that. The big issue here is how things evolve, especially in the last 10 years. We don't produce data and information this way anymore. I have a friend who took his young daughter into the office and she walked past the copying machine and the computers and everything else and said, Daddy, what's that? It was a typewriter. She had never seen one before. We don't store information this way in, in, anymore. And we don't search for this way anymore. And we don't transmit it this way anymore. If you go to Universal Studios and you go to Harry Potter World, uh, that picture, I took that picture there. I found it uh, very indicative of what, what mail looks like these days for doing that because it's starting to feel like this for many people. Not in actuality, but just in terms of the amount of information that we tend to sort through, read, glance. I, I came up with a term the other day. I referred to someone, I flash read those things. 
I mean, blink, 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 blink. I think I got enough. Next thing, next thing, flash, 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 flash. And I hope I got the, the salient points out of it because I'm not going to read it word for word for word. It's not a novel. It's not something that I'm that careful in. So we're trying to find ways to do that. And let me just put up a couple of visuals here to give you some uh, idea. You're all familiar with Moore's Law and that the uh, calculations per second double every year and a half and it continues to be true. Uh, when I started working at a supercomputing center and I compare that computing power to what's here, I'm amazed there's more here than there was in that room. And there was no petabytes and terabytes. You, you had to have a lot of money to buy one of those. And now you can buy laptops with a terabyte in them. They're, that cap That power of transmitting and storing it comes right down to the box in front of you. And even the box has gotten a lot faster. And it has also gotten a, a, a lot more capable in many dimensions for doing that. But along with that, just the amount of data that we uh, process, that we store, that we use. This is, this is a couple of years old, but it just talks about uh, the amount of big data that we have stored in various places. And this is, this is put out in terms of petabytes. And then we have zettabytes going after that. Uh, having watch in, watched it evolve, I haven't seen anything that's going to really slow a lot of it down. But again, that last two feet from the screen to me, how am I going to get it in a form and a format that makes sense to me without a lot of comprehension? Because that's really how we need it. Uh, about four or five weeks ago, I had the good fortune to do a TED talk at uh, TEDx at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. And my topic was, what do I need to know? And I realized that topic was the exact opposite of this conference. This conference talks about information being delivered and provided and pulled to us, and we pull it for different things. And the point of the talk was, no, what do I need to have up here that I can just pull out at the time? And I don't want to go through the, the talk, but it certainly includes the basics, reading, writing, listening, speaking, some level of numeracy. And I cited examples where there were short, shortcomings in the parts of people because they lack that. Things that require a lot of practice, things that require a lot of experience, things that require an immediate response right now, instantly. Police officers do that. Pilots do that. Parents do that. They can see the child getting into a problem, and they can visualize where this is going to end, and it's not going to end well, and they stop it. Okay. There's no looking for information someplace else to do that. Another piece of that that I find just spectacular is a visualization of dozens of millions of friends on Facebook. And even this is an old visual. It's a, it's a couple of years old. In that connectivity of what has... First of all, when we went from the analog world to the digital world, digital information transmits beautifully and a copy is perfect. The copy is just as good as, as the original. And so there's two features there. One is the copyability and the other is the searchability in that we can go through it very quickly to look for things. That just has brought more information closer and closer and closer. It's kind of like this earth swell, this uh, wave coming at us for doing that kind of stuff. But then it gets all the way down to the computer and we now can connect these things at 10 gigabits per second. That's like a year's worth of music downloaded in something like 30 seconds. A high definition movie can be brought all the way down to the computer in five minutes. Not on my home network, but if you had all, if all the stars are aligned, then maybe that, that's how far it can go. But still, we get back to it stops here because we have to put it in some sort of form and format that makes sense here and how we interpret that. And the human mind has immense capabilities. You can sit at an airport and watch a thousand people or five thousand people walk by and spot the face of somebody you know. Isn't that amazing? Face, 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 face. Hi. I know you. That we can do that. But we can also, there's all kinds of examples. We've, we've even seen them as kids of puzzles and things that are peculiar and we can't sort it all out. But I'm just amazed that we're down to, we're, we're up to 10 gigabits per second all the way down uh, to the device. What is the result? There was a Newsweek article. How the deluge of information paralyzes our ability to make good decisions. There is that problem that if we push too much, too fast, 
it, it actually works against our brain because it's kind of like the data equivalent of an uh, ice cream headache. That's too much. I, and we just look away. We just kind of uh, step out of it, something like that. So there was an article in Inc. that talked about this, and it says information is the enemy of insight in the sense that just dumping information to people isn't going to help give insight, it's going to work against it. It's going to be harder and harder to say, well, what is it here that's important to me? What am I supposed to be getting out of this? That point. <laughs> As the judge, what's the point? Make the point. Get to the point. Is there some way to do that? And I thought the points that were made in the article, there's two more coming up here. Half the battle is eliminating the noise. And part of that is the person who is sorting for it. And one of the big differences with all this capability right down to the device in front of us is we're not just having information pushed to us, we're pulling information to us, we're requesting information. Uh, when I did the TED talk, I walked out and I said, how many of you in the audience in the last week have used Google search? Every hand went up. And I said, did you feel guilty about that? No. Did you feel empowered? Well, that was kind of a neutral question. But it sure is easy, isn't it? But my point is, there are lots of situations where I don't want somebody Googling it because I want the information to be there faster. I don't want my pilot Googling a solution if the engine goes out. I've got to get the manual downloaded here, and I've got to find the right page, and I've got to figure out how to restart this thing, something like that. But the point here is, in order to make things comprehensible for people, we need to think about it in terms of simplifying it in a form that is adaptable to what the brain is good at which is, in many cases, few words. In other cases, it's the right sets of information. So what are the criteria that have to go into that interface between the person for doing that kind of stuff? The references here, it was 10 simple laws of business success, and one of them was about the overload of information uh, for doing that kind of stuff. I put the visual up because I really like it. It kind of describes how I feel sometimes in that it's screen, 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 something like that. So, to get to the recipient, not just to the person, but to get to their understanding of things, the first three criteria are kind of boring, so I just put them all up in one slide. One of them is it needs to be convincing and believable. You know, kids think if it's on the internet, it must be true. Well, we always still need to have our instincts saying, is that right? I had a, a guy the other day tell me that he had read something that the earth was tilting more. <laughs> and I wanted to argue with him and saying, well, no, I don't think so. And, you know, does your satellite TV still in focus? Does the GPS still work? Is the North Star still where you left it? But he believed this and he said, oh, check it out. It's on the internet. <laughs> And so I checked it out, and there was a scathing indictment by some professor that said that web page over there does not have a shred of science in it. And I thought, I need to go find this guy and give him this other article and say, if it sounds really weird, maybe it's really weird. <laughs> so one of them is that it, that it is cogent. The next one is that it's concise. Always, always, always. Brief as possible because it needs to be uh, not any more than, than what the person is looking for. Now they tell journalists if you're writing an article, you, the main points you want to make should be up there on the front somewhere. They should be where people can get to them. You don't have to keep, I'm sure you've all read things where you're waiting for that point, you're reading on, you're reading on, no it's not there, I'll go down to the next one, I'll go down to the next one. Where is it? It's not, there's a lot of time spent digging and sorting and reading. And then, of course, this one really matters, the validity of the information. It has to be uh, correct, uh, free of errors, and hopefully without too much bias. Uh, this is a little sidetrack, but uh, James Carville made the comment that people watch the media the same way that a drunk uses a lamppost. It's more for support than illumination. <laughs> And people tend to gravitate to those sources that are going to provide them with information that they kind of already believe. <laughs> I thought that was a nonpartisan comment <laughs> for doing that. So cogent, concise, correct, and that there are three more points. But let's take a look at some examples. I always, this one was put up in, back in 2009, 
And the Department of Energy produced this because they were trying to standardize what the measure of energy were. And on the left-hand side, you can see that there is uh, the sources of energy. And the amount of energy that comes from those sources is defined by the width of that, the line on the left-hand side. And all the way over on the right-hand side are where that energy ends up. Who's using it? What is the demand for it? And there's a split off there between a gray and the dark gray. And that's because every time you produce energy and transmit it to some other source, they don't get all of it that somebody produces. Some amount of it gets lost. If you could get all the gasoline in your car to make your car go forward, you would probably go forward at least twice as far as you do. And they do better than they used to do for that. There's, there's loss of energy at that point. And I just find it uh, very interesting because if you look at petroleum here, I know, I'm sorry, this is hard to read. This goes back to the point you had made about it's all too small. Petroleum and coal and natural gas, those are the three big ones. And that's where we get most of our energy. And you can kind of see a lot of it goes over to electrical generation, especially on the coal and some of the natural gas. Uh, and petroleum goes pretty much to transportation. And when you see a 12-year-old saying, well, we should go to solar power. We should just go to solar power and other renewable energies. I, I'm not going to argue against that. I think it's a great idea. My father used to say to me, what are we going to do 100 years from now? Some of these sources we're using just aren't going to be there in the quantities they are now. What are we going to do? And he was putting it way out there because he thought that makes the best argument. And so we will make changes. But this visual tells me it's going to take a while. And there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of things. And which of those should we be doing? Probably all of them. We should probably be pursuing all of them <laughs> at some point. But I just thought it was a nice visual that shows the connection. And the, the width of the line is based in a common unit of the amount of energy from those sources. It's very compelling. Uh, this is another one that I thought was kind of interesting in the energy area. And it talks about the fact that if these are the sources of energy and how they've grown, and we want to cut out the bottom one, which is coal, we can expect that the, if the oil stays about the same and we're gonna, the demand for energy is going to increase, then we've got to fill that gap. And by showing you that simple diagram with those yellow arrows, uh, I know that everyone in the room is looking at the exact same spot, because that's the point I want to make. You've got to expand those to deal with the decrease in the one at the bottom for doing that. Okay, another point is simple. It's easy to understand. It has few elements to it. And what I'd like to do as an example is I used to teach, when I taught simulation, I used to give this problem to students, and the problem would take a whole page in words. And what I did was I converted it into one slide so that I can describe the problem to you. And it's a tanker arriving at a harbor at a random distribution, which is exponential, and the average is 36 hours. Every 36 hours, one arrives. And they're unloaded at a rate, or they carry a quarter of a million barrels of oil. This is actually simple enough with a visual that you can remember the key components. So they come every 36 hours on an average with an exponential distribution at a quarter of a million barrels. And this is the offloading rate. The maximum rate is 400,000 barrels. And they goes into a tank farm that has 700,000 barrels in it. The fuel from that storage tank goes off to a refinery at a constant, constant quarter of a million barrels. And every time a ship is stuck in the harbor for longer than 48 hours, you have to pay an hourly demurge fee for that. So the question in the case is, very simply, we want to double the size of the tankers and have them come half as often. Double their size half as often. Would that save us money? And the demurge fee on the new tankers is higher, by the way. Will it save money? Twice as big, half as often. The immediate reaction is, shouldn't make any difference, but it does. This gives me a chance to show you a visual and also talk about why we do simulation, because there's some issues there. Well, here's the results. The small tankers, and see, there's six numbers, and I know that that's simple enough that you can take a look at it. The average demurrage fee for small tankers is 219. For large, it's two orders of magnitude higher. Whoa, didn't see that coming. The maximum for versus 204,000. That's what happens if you bring the larger tankers. And the number of times out of 100 replications goes from 13 to 43. The answer to the question is, is it a good idea to double the size of the tankers? No, it's not. I give this to the students, and they run it. They come back to the results, 
and I wait and I wait and somebody says, you know, maybe it's the size of that storage tank. Maybe we should put in a bigger storage tank to deal with that variability of the arrivals of the tankers. Okay, your new assignment is do it again, but increase the capacity of the tank. And here we go. We've taken it up from 700,000 to a million. For the little tanker, it kind of doesn't really change things a whole lot. And see, what I know you're doing is you're comparing from the top to the bottom, the top to the bottom, and then you're comparing from left to right. The bigger storage capacity on the ground improves things for the large tankers. It really doesn't affect things too much for the small tankers. And I'm a simulation nut. And I've always said the reason you do simulation is to make your mistakes as quickly as possible. Hopefully in an artificial environment where you're not wasting a lot of money. That's somebody else's decision to do. But the most important point is if doing a simulation leaves you with a set of questions now that you couldn't even think of earlier, you're on the right track. And so the conclusion of all this, oh by the way, this is one replication and let me show you what the problem is. When the tankers come close together, they queue up because you can only unload one at a time and then what happens is the tank fills up so the offloading rate goes from 400,000 down to 250,000 because you got to take a barrel out to the refinery to have space for another barrel to go in. So just when you got tankers queued up and you should be increasing the offloading rate, you got to decrease it. You know, it's like when a line builds, we, take, we close out some of the checkout stands. <laughs> so they queue up, they, they max out up there and then you get a demerge fee because you finally backed them up long enough. Well, real quickly, small tankers are more efficient than the large tankers. We saw that in the numbers. But the other things were the storage tank capacity is an issue. But the other two really important points were the variance is the demon to the whole thing. If you get those tankers that come on a better schedule, the problem, most of the problems go away. So it's the variance that's really causing the problems. Ah. And then the other thing is there's insufficient fuel regardless. Because they're getting a quarter of a million barrels every 36 hours on an average and the refinery needs a quarter of a million barrels every 24 hours. And that you can do <laughs> on the back of an envelope. <laughs> and I always wonder, did any of you see that before you got started for doing that? So here's a really simple problem. What we've tried to do is put it into a visual form for you. Well, let's move on to the interaction. I, I like to throw this in for just a second. The, th the reasons we do simulation is because we're looking for delays, errors, variance, capacity, and feedback. I would teach operations courses and say, these five points are in every chapter on everything we deal with and it's going to be on the final. <laughs> and they all write it down. And I put it on the final. <laughs> what are these five factors? Because if you pair up any two of them, you get a set of common conditions that oftentimes people in operations systems are dealing with. So here's all of them, n times n minus 1 divided by 2. If you've got five items, there's 10 pairs, and these are likely conditions for that. And most managers are on the right-hand side trying to figure out what it is on the left-hand side that's, that's really the root of those things. I wanted to show you another example that deals with mapping a process visually. The state of Alaska hired a group of us to study the security of the voting machines. In the state of Alaska, the uh, state runs the election. The whole election, they control all the machines. And that's because there are no counties in a lot of places. In a lot of rural areas, uh, machines are put out to rural areas by bypass mail and things like that. So we have optical scanning machines and we have touchscreen machines. And both are used and both are available. And the issue was, where are the problems with the security of ballots, data, and machines to do that kind of stuff? So this is the flow of those things, voting machines, memory cards, data transfer, and ballots. So what I did was I came up with a map and I said, okay, but way before the election the machines are all locked up in election hubs and regional offices. And the computing machine is sitting in Juneau, Alaska, off the network. Nobody else can get to it for that. But as you move closer to election, those machines are moved to regional areas and they are configured and they're tested and memory chips go into them and then they're moved out to election offices and the, then by the election day, they go to the poll. And after the poll, the data is transmitted out of them by dial-up modem, anybody remember? <laughs> to a GEMS machine, which is a general election machine. Uh, and then 
the ballots are moved, the machines are moved, the memory chips are moved, and in the case of the uh, touchscreen machines, the roll of paper. In the state of Alaska, the law says every vote must end up on a piece of paper. And the reason for that is if you have a machine storing votes in memory and that machine croaks in the middle of the day, well, who voted and how did they vote? We don't know. It was gone. So this, the legislature says everyone's got to be on a piece of paper. That way when you do a recount, you've got something else to count. But what occurred to us by doing the diagram is every single place those items sit has its own security issues and every time they moved from one place to another, it had another set of security issues. And it allowed us to systematically look at every place they sat and every place they moved. And it's interesting that where things aggregate after the election, the level of security gets higher and higher. And it's almost treated like evidence at that point. There will be no ballots in the trunk of a car found six months later. It's just not going to happen. There's, there's, a, there's a million stories about this stuff. This is the other machines, and they pretty much move the same way for doing that, but the votes go on paper. And the interesting thing about the scanning cards are if the machine breaks, people mark the cards anyway and stick them in the box. They'll scan them later on another machine. There's another way to do that. The redundancy is kind of useful. But this is a visual, and you notice that I titled the presentation Visualizing Problems, Models, and Solutions, because I find oftentimes what I'm trying to create an image of for people is, what are we doing? What do we need to know here? We do the drawing on the front end. By the way, all of these were done in PowerPoint. I've become quite good at building little objects and grouping them and then building other objects and grouping them and grouping them. The next criteria is what I call interesting. And I think that's because it is easier to navigate with information that is painted to us in a form that is relevant to what we are interested in. Marketing people have been doing this for years. They understand that for doing that. I want to make sure I don't run out of time here. This was an energy model we were working on as a proposal. We presented it at an Ener Arctic Energy Summit a number of years ago. If you take a remote village anywhere in the world, they have demand for heat and light and fuel for boats and planes and trucks and whatever else. And so we tried to come up with a way of looking at how we could evaluate alternative energy sources for doing those things. How can they meet a gallon of gas in a rural area can be ten, twelve dollars a gallon. And if they run short it gets even more expensive because they have to fly it in if the weather permits. But the, the, the demand side of it is we need fuel for heating, we need fuel to run generators to make electricity in many cases, and we need fuel for four-wheelers and snow machines and trucks and whatever else. We'll leave airplanes out of the problem here. And it's about one-third each for doing that. So on the demands, on the supply side, this is pretty much the story. Diesel fuel was provided both for heating and it is also run, running generators which produce the electricity and that takes care of the top two-thirds and the one-third is simply fuel that is provided that is used for uh, transportation at that point. And the issue here is what about different alternatives? The state of Alaska Industrial Development Export Authority produced an energy atlas. It was a very interesting document because it shows across the state who has access to geothermal energy who has access to wind energy, who has access to solar energy, uh, tidal energy, all other forms of renewable uh, resources. Uh, this conference had a lot of people including the uh, president of Iceland. And Iceland was smart enough to build their cities on top of volcanoes and so they have so much energy that is so inexpensive. Do you know that there's ref uh, plants producing aluminum in Iceland? And the plants are there because the energy is cheap and you, you need a lot of electricity for making aluminum. And of course the heat just comes off hot water. Well the other issues in ter terms of treating this as a system is of course the cost. We are cost sensitive but when we deal with necessities we are less cost sensitive. We still buy gas for our car even if the price goes up because it's still better than walking. How much would I pay to get transported those 10 miles versus how much does it cost me to just put the gas in a car and go? And then the other thing, of course, is energy conservation, which is a big part of it. Let's just use less for that. And then the other part of it was feedback. People will conserve more if they know how they are conserving. Classic study, 
apartment complexes were identical, they randomly assigned gauges into half the houses so the people could see how much energy they're consuming. They consumed less energy because they could see real time how much they were doing day by day by day for doing that. So the actual model was on the right hand side and we tied the, the plumbing and wiring of the model on the right hand side to the icons on the left side. So we went from something simple to something more complex rather than starting with just the complex image on that side. Here's another example. I created this drawing because if you take heavy oil out of the ground and you heat it up, you separate the water and the oil and the sand at that point. And so as we were trying to explain to people how that process goes for doing that, this is kind of what it would look like. This is a hypothetical example. This is not similar to any uh, particular separation system. That's what the stuff looks like when it comes out of the ground. It's a, it's a bear to pump and it's gooey and so, in some cases it's so thick it's augered out for doing that. Well that drawing you just saw was a lot simpler than this one because this one represented the separation over here on the left hand side. You heat it up and the sand goes to the bottom and the oil goes to the top because it's lighter than the water. Well, we had some fun with this. I'm going to blow up this line. This is just one replication because the heat exchanger needs to be in the liquid because if the liquid is too low, nothing gets heated. But then you need to keep the heating element in the oil, not in the water because the water is corrosive and you certainly don't want it in the sand. So as you run this thing over time and you take out sand periodically and you take out oil periodically and you take out water periodically, these things go up and down. You take out sand, everything comes down. You take out uh, water in the middle, the oil comes down. So you're trying to keep the heat exchanger between the water and the oil. And that's where it's sitting. And it was really interesting. We played around with an iteration of this thing. How much should we take out at a time? Things like that. We got really close right there where that oval's at. It was just a simple picture saying you need to be aware that these things can happen. We also found out that the way to get this thing started is you fill it with clean water and heat that sucker up. Because when you start bringing in heavy oil you better have something to put heat in the heavy oil and it's got to be water. Because you can't just start the tank empty for doing that. I, so we suggested that you, that you do that. This is a big problem that, that is a supply chain problem and uh, I'm going to show you that as we worked on moving a product from Texas to the North Slope of Alaska, that's kind of how we described it. And they're moved by railroad cars to Seattle and the railroad cars are put on barges. They literally roll the railroad cars on a barge. They pull the barge to Whittier, Alaska where it meets up with the Alaska railroad tracks. They roll everything off and there's gobs and gobs and gobs of freight that come this way. And in this case these tanks go to Fairbanks and they sit there, this is the barge picture of the railroad. The, the, the liquid is put on IMOs, which are tanks, it takes four of those to empty out a railroad tank, railroad car, and they're put on trucks, flatbed trucks, and dro driven to the North Slope. And what we're trying to do is figure out how does this whole system work, where are our decision rules, uh, how, many t how many railroad cars do we need? And of course, when the tanks, railroad cars are emptied, they're rolled back to Whittier, put back on the barge, rolled back to Seattle, floated back to Seattle, and pulled back down to Texas for doing that. Fill back up and come back up. That was the problem, and I like to use this diagram because that's the problem picture. And so what I did was we found ourselves, well, we need to know this, we need to know that. I'm going to put the whole thing in here. This is what the model looks like. It doesn't matter what the model looks like. You cannot communicate this to people in a room simply. Well, what is all that plumbing and wiring for doing that? We created this diagram on the right hand side because that's the conceptual model, visualizing problems, models, and solutions. I'm going to bring up a larger version of that because you can see now what I'm talking about. Empty cars in Texas going north to Seattle and so they're gray and I need to know the travel distribution on that. When they get on the barge, the barges go to Whittier. How long does that take? Uh, <laughs> we don't know. Talk about that. How long does it take for the railroad cars to get? We don't, we don't really know. So we created this picture because that allowed us to say, I need to know that and that and that and that and what things are assumptions that are not relevant to that. And of course, 
I was finally given, I'll use this as an example, transporting barges north and south, winter months, which are the worst. I got, I think, six years worth, and I did analysis on that to see what the distribution is. These things never go fast in, in supply chains. But the odds of them going slow, it's like this distribution that goes up to here and then tails out. Because there's always those, that small probability could take a long time. Just everything goes wrong for doing that. And of course you only know those things when you uh, get the real data and you analyze it for doing that. So we had some decision rules in here. This was a visual of the problem and it really helped speed things up in terms of, well, what do we need to do to put into the model. This was kind of an interface to the simulation model for doing that. I tried to match up the colors and put a control panel on it so I can slide things around. This is just a static image. Because I find that the visual, the people I'm working with can take it to other people and say, well, here's what we're doing and this is what this is and this is, I see that, I see that, I understand that, I comprehend that. That's the part that we want out of that. So that's what the whole model looked like. Those are the barges, that's the slope on the top. This was the railroads at the bottom. This is the trucking going north and empty trucks coming back, things like that. And that's some accountability over there and then some more data accounting over here for doing that kind of thing. So of the six criteria, there's two more. One of them is accessible so that I can really get to it. I like to put this up be because I am a pilot and I find that one of the things I wanted to show you about this is, you've seen what an old instrument panel looks like on airplanes, it's a bunch of gauges and things. It's very hard to comprehend what exactly does all of that mean. Well, with all this technology and GPS and ADSB, we can paint not only the map, we can paint where we are in the map. We see the red areas? That means the land is below us or above us. You don't fly to the red because it's real hard. <laughs> But the neatest thing is if you look over on the right hand corner, there's a button at the very bottom called NRST. That stands for nearest. And I'm using this as an example because it's so outrageous. If a pilot needs to put the airplane down, he pushes that button and it paints up there the 10 nearest airports. The direction they're in, the elevation of them, and the frequency, the key frequency they need. I need that piece of information right now. And if they've programmed this thing right, if the plane is big enough that it needs 3,000 feet of runway, the database automatically deletes everything under 3,000 feet. You don't want to go there because you're not going to fit. So just tell me where I'm going to go right now. There's my nearest. So that makes it, that information, you don't care about it, well, they always think about it. But if I need to know it, I push that button and it gives me that information. Where it's located, the distance that it is, the elevation of it, the length of the runway, and the frequency that's there. It, it's, uh, it's my perfect example of accessible information at that point. And I like to use this one. There's all these applications now on iPads and phones for looking for real estate. And for this conference, I like the fact that what it does is it gives you the interface of the map because that's what you're familiar with and the flags represent houses for sale and their asking price or whatever it is at that point. But the really neat thing is the user, the interface is so simple that they can you can show someone this thing and they can use it. You don't care where the database is, but it knows to go out and get the houses that are within that rectangle right there. And the most magical thing to me is when you move the screen, let's just say to the left, it takes everything off the list that went off the screen and it goes back and gets every other house that just got put on the screen at that point. What a beautiful interface for doing that kind of stuff. I just think that it's, uh, it's really interesting because it provides those things. So in conclusion, let me just kind of summarize things here. We still have to go back and think about that last two feet. And I'm a pilot and so I have to make this kind of analogy. All the instruments and an airplane provide us with the answers to two questions. Where am I and how's the system running? And I think in organizations we rephrase it, but we really want to know in the organization, where am I and how's the system running? How are the people doing? How's the fleet doing? How are the finances doing? How are the ovens doing? Whatever else there is. And so we used to have it that way, which is darn near incomprehensible. This is what we need to know. 
Well, we moved on to glass screens and they've become more sophisticated, but kind of in my summary, this is a small airplane. And look at how beautiful those screens are. But the most important thing is the information that's in front of that person as it's getting dark is it's cogent, concise, and correct. <laughs> it's simple. You can actually see a lake out there, and you can see the lake right here as they're turning. And you can see they're turning because there's the, the artificial horizon is tipped. That person has looked at those screens just long enough that they know exactly what they need to know. I find that when people give me directions, they say, uh, go down to 7th Street and turn left and go down to the old gas station and then go down there. I hate those directions because they don't work in my mind. Give me a map. I can look at the map and say, okay, I got it because the map works for me. Simple. I can tell you for this person at this point in time, that information is interesting. <laughs> and as soon as it gets completely dark, it becomes even more interesting at that point. And it's accessible. They can access it and it can come up uh, relative to that. So let me leave it there and say thank you. I do want to mention before we quit that there's brochures on the chairs there that deal with uh, an announcement for the June 22nd, 24th uh, big data conference, uh, which is out in uh, San Jose, California. Uh, better weather. <laughs> and again, these are available if any, any of you would like them. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>